Our next guest, Parag Khanna, argues that, quote, the Asian Arab nexus will determine West Asia's future more than any diktats from Washington or London. His new book is The Future is Asian. And Parag joins me now from our studio in New York this evening. Pakistan then rolling out the red carpet for the Crown Prince, who arrived pledging help to the cash-strapped country to the tune of some $20 billion. These countries have had a long, close military relationship. Is this so more than just about optics at a time when the kingdom's reputation has been so tarnished in the West? It's great to be with you, Becky. And yes, it is uh, more than just uh, about optics. It's certainly a very strong continuation. As you rightly suggested, there is decades of history between these countries, from the energy ties, the economic bailouts, obviously religious ties, Saudi sponsorship of certain kinds of, uh, you know, uh, Sunni religious institutions in the country of Pakistan. Obviously, Saudi has been the exile home for previous leaders of Pakistan and so forth. And this, obviously, this very strong financial package comes at a time when the country really does need it. Uh, you know, others in the media have rightly pointed out that this uh, bailout or combination of bailout loans, abatements for energy payments and so forth comes at a time when Pakistan was going to need to require a significant amount of uh, capital infusion lending from the IMF, and this is going to diminish that requirement. And so, as I say, the Arab-Asian nexus, you know, Pakistan can rely on West Asian powers like Saudi Arabia or uh, to the East, great powers like China. China to, in combination, help support it through these difficult fiscal times. And talk to us about the wider story here as the Crown Prince moves from Pakistan to, well, I have to say quite sensitively, to India and then on to China. You, you have talked about in your book fresh investments spanning the breadth of this new maritime silk road from the Strait of Ormuz to the Strait of Malacca, the world's most significant energy passageways. You describe a much bigger, wider story here, uh, that being not just financial, but it will, will, will shift the tectonic plates with regard geopolitics as well going forward if this works, correct? That's right, Becky. And let's view the present moment in the context as just one new chapter uh, in a 30-year story, because the story of the Arab world, particularly the Gulf energy exporters, shifting their geostrategic focus, their economic focus, certainly their trade balance towards the South and East Asian powers across the Indian Ocean, whether it is Japan, South Korea, China, and India, as their largest export markets. That story, Becky, began when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s. In many ways, the Belt and Road Initiative, China's efforts to use Pakistan and other Central Asian countries to connect infrastructurally all the way to West Asia, through Afghanistan and Iran, to the Arab world, that story also began in the 1990s. And so we're seeing right now the culmination of decades, actually, of uh, investments, of trade, of infrastructure coming together. And again, it fits the economic cycles, the strategic realities right. and shifts. And, you know, as you know, Becky, uh, King Salman, uh, you know, made a major visit across uh, Asian countries uh, several years ago as well. And this follows in the footsteps of that. So we should not view this as a unique event. We should view it as a part of this new, uh, almost a culmination of uh, everything that's been happening for the past couple of decades and will certainly deepen into the future. Parag, had it, though, not been for the reputational damage done to the kingdom, by the uh, murder of Jamal Khashoggi, there had been an enormous uh, effort made on sort of a, a, a bilateral, transactional basis between, for example, companies out of the United States and the investment fund out of Saudi Arabia. There was a real coming together we've seen over the last couple of years uh, with a view to this uh, Vision 2030 for Saudi. Are you saying that this sort of trip and this sort of spend and this sort of investment from Saudi was always going to happen? Or are, you, are we to believe that it is even more important that the kingdom uh, looks towards the East these days because of what has happened uh, in the light of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? 
Uh, Becky, that's a great question. The answer is both. Uh, as I document very clearly, mm. the trends around the capital repatriation by Gulf sovereign wealth funds, which hold a collective two to three trillion dollars out of Western markets in order to shore up their own fiscal position, that was underway for years, right? Uh, it, it really goes back to 2015, 2016. Um, and then the new energy deals, whether it's petrochemical refineries and new energy export channels and infrastructure projects between Gulf sovereign wealth funds and Asian ones, whether it is China, Korea, Japan, and new commercial deals with, uh, with the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia bringing in Korean contractors oh. to do new shipyards. All of that, Becky, has been happening for years and years. So what's happening now is just, again, the next step forward. And of course, the fanfare and the diplomatic uh, signaling around a trip um, in, you know, to Asian countries where MBS does not have to feel, you know, sort of shy and hiding and apologetic because Asians clearly are not emphasizing or criticizing the country on mm. human rights and other issues. That obviously is for him, in a way, the icing on the cake. But was this trip going to happen in terms in terms of deepening the structural ties that are already well so, underway, without a doubt. Parag is in New York for you. Parag, thank you. Pleasure having you on.